Tonight on the Genesis Science Report, we examine a discovery that raises maybe more questions than it answers. A new study has revealed the preservation of human brains, which was unexpected considering some remains were thousands of years old. It is again shocking the scientific community with new data about soft tissue preservation and decay. This unprecedented find is researchers again scratching their heads when it comes to the presence of original organic matter. Joining us to discuss the science and the implications is Dr. Joe DeWeese, Professor of Biochemistry and Director of Undergraduate Research at Fried Hardeman University. Dr. DeWeese, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Good to be with you. It is great to have you back again. So let's start with the basics. Can you explain why the preservation of soft tissues, especially brains, is so rare in the natural world? And how is this new study challenging what we previously thought about? tissue preservation? Yeah, it's a great question. Good to be back with you, David. Um, you know, as we think about uh, what happens at death really is what we're talking about here. So when uh, just any organism dies, right, what typically happens? You know, if you think about, uh, let's just give the example kind of crude of roadkill, right? So what happens to an animal that dies on the side of the road? Well, obviously its body begins to decay, but then there's scavengers that come and tear it apart and take, you know, parts of it and so forth. And so you really don't have much left there, right? Uh, over time, it's it's going to get uh, dragged away. It's going to get eaten. Um, and there's also processes going on, though, within the organism itself where uh, the tissues begin to break down themselves. Uh, while we're alive, our cells remain intact and functioning and keep at bay some of the enzymes and things that actually are designed to kind of break things down. Uh, and so once death occurs and those cells uh, are in an organism that now is no longer living, uh, energy uh, flow slows down and comes to a halt. And ultimately those cells will begin to destroy themselves uh, and break things down. And that happens really across all tissues. Uh, so, you know, you just think about um, any organism that dies, it's, it's going to break down over time, whether by, you know, scavenging from uh, creatures in the environment or uh, itself, it's just going to naturally break down. Uh, and so forensic science, for instance, would, uh, would study these processes to get some idea of, uh, you know, how long has this body been dead? Well, we can look at the state of decomposition of the tissues to get some uh, kind of timeline for, okay, here's how long uh, this creature, you know, has been dead. So that kind of gives you some sense of, um, you know, timing, how long uh, th that this has been taking place. Well, you know, so go ahead. Yeah, well, Joe, I, I had to actually read it twice just to make sure that what I was reading was, was not the fossilized remains of mm -hmm. brains, right? But, but then the more I, I I'm reading through it, you know, it's like, no, no, there, there are still soft, pliable tissues in mm -hmm. here, which again is a staggering number of preserved brains because they're talking about uh, more than 4,000 that have been found uh, spanning continents. And mm -hmm. so what are some of the most significant findings from this report? And why does the preservation of the brain stand out as opposed to, you shared a little bit, but as opposed to, let's just say any other a tissue that would be found in the human body? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, as you think about, um, so so let's talk about what they did and then we'll think about kind of why why this is significant. So uh, what the study did, and by the way, the, the paper, the research paper is out there and available. It's in what's called the Royal Society of Publications, what they call Proceedings B, which is, a, a you know, a prestigious uh, journal of the Royal Society. Uh, of uh, science, and um, this particular one was published by a group uh, from the University of Oxford. Okay, so this is not um, an obscure group here uh, that's, that's publishing this work, um, and so they're, you know, they're at working at a really prestigious institution doing a big study, and the question they asked was, how common is it to find record of preserved brains uh, in um, you know, the, the scientific literature. And they actually went back in time pretty far, uh, looking back in time as far as um, the, you know, records as old as the 17th century uh, yeah. to identify, um, you know, where there was record of preserved brains. And uh, they have dated these brains to be as old as 12,000 years old. That's obviously on a conventional dating uh, timescale. 
and these probably uh, these twelve thousand year old brains we would probably look at as as post flood. Um, you know, brains, but in general, they, they've dated these uh, as, you know, thousands of years old. Some of them were that old. Some of them were much newer. Uh, but what was interesting was where they thought there would be, you know, maybe a few hundred records of, of such uh, of brains being preserved. Um, they actually found uh, about 4,400 uh, records of these brains being preserved. And about a third of those and about a third of the cases the brain was the only tissue left, uh, which is kind of interesting um, because, you know, when we think about this from a modern forensic science perspective, uh, the brain tends to start breaking down pretty quickly. There's a lot of enzymes in the neurons and cells of the brain. And as those die off, uh, they release those enzymes and uh, those things can start breaking down the tissues. And so interestingly, these were uh, preserved um, and, and held. So, so they, they say that it's about 20 times, uh, there's about 20 times more than were previously known as far as ancient preserved uh, brain soft tissue specimens. And so that's really interesting. I don't know how many of those still exist uh, because what they what they did here is they actually looked through the literature databases, not, not necessarily try to find the individual brains, but found papers writing about those brains uh, and cataloged that. And so that's kind of interesting to think about just from the perspective of now we've got 4,400 records of, of these preserved, um, you know, soft tissues from brains. As you noted, um, the paper shows uh, in one of the figures where they came from. Uh, and essentially, you've got uh, major representation in Europe, uh, but you've also got representation in Asia, Africa, South America, North America, uh, and so, you know, places across the globe. Uh, really uh, represented in this study. So it's really interesting to think about where these different things came from, uh, and then also to think about what state they were in. And so, for instance, some of them were uh, frozen because they're up in far Arctic regions. And so you can understand how those might be preserved. Some of them were dehydrated. And so the dehydration may also have played a factor in preserving them. Others had on, undergone certain forms of preservation, uh, that involve modifications of the actual chemistry of the molecules in the brain. And some of that's natural, and some of that may have been brought on by actions of people who uh, actually may have treated the individuals, embalmed them in some way. And so you got some combination of, of factors coming into uh, the preservation of these brains, um, some of it natural, like temperature or being in a very dry, arid climate or um, frozen, uh, and others were more chemical in nature and may have involved, you know, intervention of people in those times. You mentioned in some of the cases that the brain was all that was the only soft tissue that was left. Most of the other material was decayed away and, and that there are multiple preservation mechanisms like freezing or dehydration. But right. when it comes to finding, see, when you're looking all the way back to Ice Age finds and still seeing soft tissue preservation, then it starts to bring up the idea of, well, of of course, we find mammoths are, uh, you know, smilodons, saber-toothed tigers that are very well preserved. But then you find some dinosaur remains with very well preserved original biomolecules. And one of the excuses given is um, iron preservation or something like that. Can mm -hmm. high presences of iron really stretch things out over thousands of years? And if it can, can it stretch preservation of soft tissues out for 66 plus million years is the next question. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think there's there'll be a lot of research to kind of ask some of those questions. It certainly has, uh, you know, uh, become a very hot topic in, in certain areas of science to really think about okay, we're seeing more and more examples of these soft tissues being preserved across what has been presumed to be, like you said, not just thousands of years, but but tens of millions of years or 100 million years or more. And so the question is, you know, what mechanism could bring about such preservation over such deep time? Um, you know, iron, things like this have been pointed to. Um, they may offer some stability, uh, but, but we really have no... Um, I mean, you know, how do you measure something that presumably happened across such vast time and, and do any tests in the current day to see if that would even happen in such deep time? So, right. you know, at best we can extrapolate and our extrapolations could be wildly inaccurate. So we have to be really careful about trying to take 
you know, observations that say, well, maybe, uh, maybe iron, you know, is sufficient. Well, it might be, but we don't know if it's sufficient across a hundred thousand or a million or a hundred million years. Uh, that kind of deep time, I don't think we really fathom uh, how badly wrong our calculations could be, even if we're off by a small amount, right? So, uh, so there's there is a lot of interest in this, yeah. and and you know, to be fair to the col to our uh, scientific colleagues who don't uh, agree with our viewpoint, they're trying their best to explain these things in their model, in the context of their model, and I respect that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm afraid that their their methods over time these are going to come up short because the reality is. Uh, whether it's the soft tissue we're talking about with these brains or if it's uh, proteins and things that have been identified in ancient fossils, uh, those things don't just last like that for long periods of time. I mean, Mary Schweitzer's work in the late 90s, early 2000s, and even up till relatively uh, recent, uh, was attacked by her colleagues who said, look, there's no way those things could happen, right? She has the famous video where they are stretching what appears to be a blood vessel, right, from T-Rex and and showing that it's pliable and stretchy. Well, Absolutely. how does that happen, you know, across 65 million years, that that remains enough intact to still be stretchy and pliable today? It's challenging yeah. everything that most people thought they knew about the age of some of these things. It has incredible biblical implications, but more than that, sure. Dr. DeWeese, your research into this uh, takes it even farther into sequencing some of these things that have been found, and I cannot wait to see uh, where it leads. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to. Yeah, there's there's a lot of exciting things coming, and you know, the reality is we have tools today that weren't available to us, you know, uh, even a, a decade ago. And some of these tools are opening up new doors that may allow us to ask questions about uh, things that we thought were long lost, right? When I was in graduate school, the assumption was, yeah, anything in, in uh, fossilized tissues, anything like that, it's long gone. There's gonna be no DNA, no trace of that, no proteins. And, and a lot of that's been upended. And we have evidence not only of proteins, but of DNA and if there's DNA, it could be potentially sequenced. And so there's some excitement there that uh, some doors may open that we thought were closed. I can't wait to have you back on. Thank you again. And that is it for today. I want to thank you for joining us on the Genesis Science Report. Until next week, keep looking up. I'm David Reeves. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God.